So uh, if the text is in classical Latin, the dirty parts might be in either Greek or medieval Latin. The text is in Greek, the dirty parts will be in Latin. Uh, I remember reading, uh, was it uh, the Golden Plow or some such kind of Golden Lotus. And it had, it had the, the yeah. dirty parts. Not that I, even, I was in high school and I could read a couple of them. I remember some, some uh, erotic or exotic dance some woman does in some Greek ritual and she uh, pulls up her uh, pants or dress kind of usque of Trivata's party. Got that one? It's just that his understanding of how you might get to another world sucked. 
<laughs> and I don't have any problem with, oh, you get to another world, why are you with? If it felt like another world when you were there, rather than, you know, spinning a cobweb between the sun and the moon to have a battle on. Yeah, I had, um, given that my, my last science fiction novel had a, a bridge of flowers between Pluto and Karma, I, I did not <laughs> actually <laughs> in any place to judge. <laughs>
raises the, the question, what is it, I mean, are we, look, are we looking for, as we do this, sort of proto-science fiction, that is to say the beginnings of science fiction, or uh, are we looking actually in the opposite direction, and saying, okay, and now you could pick out something, something like we should have signed us up, and say, all right, that's the beginning, that's the very first, and there's others that follow on that, and it develops and creates more of the same kind of thing, and finally ends up with um, Frankenstein, and then that becomes, is that what we're doing? Is that, is that that's a that's a notable history, but I don't think I don't think you can do that because there's no development. There's yeah. no connect, none of them connect. Yeah. A lot of them are just clustered into like amazing tales or whatever. They don't connect. Yeah. And then you can look at it from the other way around, and I don't think that kind of doesn't help either really say, all right, we're gonna take science fiction. This is what I think you're doing when you're talking about the solution. We're gonna take science fiction and say these kinds of things happen in science fiction. People go to travel to the moon, they go to the planets, they, you know, do the various things. And then you go back into the past to find or locate those same things in stories of the past. But are they the same things? So you actually decided that these, that, that, that in 2001 when they go to Jupiter, that's the same thing as in the ocean of Sama going to the moon? So it's not the thing I do. You I do. Okay, we're talking about, just to roll back just briefly, we're talking about um, the, the sun and the moon don't have any, like, like they could be anywhere, they could be anything, they don't have any real differentiation from a, a particular island on planet Earth. I think that's an intensely modern way to look at it because we know what the sun and the moon are like. We know what the moon is like in 2001 and in, in reality. They had this, I, I do believe it comes from the same impulse, and I, in some sense, all science fiction as a genre is, is a set of impulses as writers that we have. It's the same impulse to look up into the sky and wonder what's there, and come up with what might be there to satisfy both your own curiosity and, as Lucian says himself, to illuminate reality through telling lies. So, so, so what I think is, the, what is science fiction is the thing that gives you the feeling that this is like science fiction, which Lucian does not give you. Okay, it's rhetorical pose rather than uh, is it a voyage to the moon. That's a science fictional thing, but it doesn't feel science fictional to me. Whereas, when I read Lucretius, and I read about the other worlds in Lucretius that were not worlds that were around other suns, because he doesn't know what other suns, but he imagines that the universe is, a, is a, a bubble, and that there are other bubbles out there that would have other Earths in the middle, and that they would be inhabited. That felt like science fiction. That was one of the most science fictional, weird feelings that I ever had. And that his, his way of imagining the universe was a science fictional way of imagining the universe, even though he wasn't writing fiction at all. He was trying to explain what experience really thought the universe was like. If I remember, for example, Voltaire's Micromagnus, where he has aliens um, who come from first the planet or being serious and then from uh, Saturn, he works hard in that to speculate, okay, what are the differences between Earth and Saturn, and therefore what are the differences going to be between Earth dwelling beings and Saturn dwelling beings. And if Saturn is this much bigger than Earth, then the Saturn dwelling beings will be huge compared to humans, and maybe they will live proportionally longer than that. So that he's worked hard the way a modern science fiction author does to have the planet and the differences between the planet and Earth be reflected in some logical way in the species that he's going to develop on this planet. In contrast with the kinds of beings that are located in the Lucian, which are very similar to the kinds of interesting other species that you get encountered in uh, Greek depictions of imaginary Ethiopia, which has a very interesting culture, uh, which is very clearly based on imagining other lands or islands that you discover. It's making me think of a really quite tedious lecture on the set there recently <laughs> about islands and people you meet on islands in 17th and 18th century Don Quixote fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> are staggering volumes, which are super popular in England, and which one person has like three words of Latin which suggest the Tempest may be based on one of these volumes of Don Quixote fanfic. But um, uh, 
there are lots of very interesting patterns in what kind of made up person and what kind of made up rich you encounter on an island in, in works by zillions of different authors in the same century versus the kind of made up culture you encounter on land as opposed to on an island because there were already these sorts of genre conventions which, which were blind genetics were not from the period, but once you immerse yourself in the period, you get to what kind of pain you encounter, what kind of adventure you have on an island versus what kind of adventure you have on land. And, and I think that the kinds of adventures that Lucian is setting on the sun and the moon are in that genre sense very similar to the kinds that you're setting in Greek fantasy, the Obia, in a way that Voltaire's Saturnian is very grounded in the extremely nascent astrological, astronomical science that Voltaire is thinking about. And that, that is a meaningful difference. Giordano Bruno never, never told a story about it, but he had a very similar idea that all the planets went around the sun, including Earth. And they were all equivalent to the Earth, and they all had beings on them that would be adapted to the kind of, of, of planet they were on, which had, of course, an astrological nature also. Uh, they'd be fiery and, and soldier-like. Uh, but he also thought that the planets went around the sun because they chose to. <laughs> but the planets were beings on their own and had a will and desire and all that kind of stuff. It's also uh, kind of stuck there. Is that, a, is that a forebear or is that, you know, a fire? It's hard to know. I mean, I feel like what we're actually getting into right now is whether or not science fiction in the classical world is hard science fiction or not. <laughs> <laughs> because, He had some information. He had information to think logically about because he knew that Saturn was a thing and was bigger than Earth. Like he had some he vicious words about Saturn. <laughs> but he doesn't know anything about it the way Voltaire does. Like it, 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 it could not possibly be more abstract from the information that, that Lucian had. I think he did a perfectly fine job likening it to Adam. And in fact, it's it's not an unsophisticated idea that this whole thing solar system the galaxy should be not different than uh, islands in the stream. Uh, and to some extent, I feel like it's kind of a limited definition of science fiction uh, to say that it's only science fiction if, if serious science that we understand now is taken into account for creating yeah. other worlds. Exactly. That's one of those, that's one of the, got to be one of the central definitions. All right. What is it? I, I uh, worked on a, uh, a modern version of a, of a kind of uh, what I consider to be a possibly a science fiction uh, novel. It was written in 1616, which is way back, not classical, but it's called uh, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz. And um, kind of a long debate in a, uh, on The Guardian, of all places, which <laughs> took up my claim that it could possibly be regarded as the first science fiction novel. And one of the, one of the commentators was just absolutely definite. You could not have science fiction before you science, and that all the stuff that we you could regard as uh, structurally equivalent to science, or sorrow-like science, or functional story-like science, and those weren't science fiction because they weren't science. Could it be alchemy, it could be any of those kinds of things functioning in stories in the same way the speculative science act works in science fiction because they work science. So and I, I could, well, there's bacon, and there's a couple of things, and uh, you know, what else come along? Yeah, so you know, would be arguing is wrong. What's the definition of science, then? Well, that's good. I mean, what's the definition of science? Well, I don't know. If the people you're talking about are talking about way long ago, I'm positive. Well, I think we have sort of this idea that if we're going to see something as science fiction, we have to judge it on their own terms. So when, whatever they empirically observe in the world, we can judge their science based on what they've taken, what they see in the world. Um, but I think science is more than just that. Uh, I, th I want to go back to what you're saying. It feels like science fiction, and I think there's something also in the idea of science that has a sensibility to it. And as a historian of, of science, particularly in the Middle East, um, there's a really great essay by Abdullah uh, Shalvi called "When Science Became Western." And her whole thing, she, it's really interesting, she traces uh, from about the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s the introduction of Darwinism by Christian missionaries into a secularizing Egypt. 
and how actually Muslims wanted to adopt Darwinism because they saw it as part of the secular, secularizing uh, their state. Uh, and she says that uh, the missionaries would translate the Arabic Quranic term ilm, which means a, a very broad knowledge that encompasses almost anything you can imagine. And they sort of secularize it into a very particular category of empirical uh, divided knowledge that was separate from maybe fantasy or religious knowledge or theology. Um, so when I think of what is science, I, I look at it just historically. And I think of that historical moment. And I know that's not a universal historical moment, but I think of that, that division then. And what, what does it mean if we're going to impose what to me seems like a very modern category onto histories where that sensibility may not have been there, or was only there in history. But what, what sensibility are we talking about? The division of categories. I mean, yeah. But then, then Aristotle's got you. Like, if we're going to talk about dividing categories, then, yeah. then if that's the definition of science, then there's absolutely no question yeah. that the classical world was a fully scientific place. Now, Greeks love to flap their gums and not do any experiments. So, <laughs> like, if you want to say that experimentation is the science, then I think we can have a conversation. But if it's categorizing, like, if Greeks aren't even the first, they are just, they just <coughs> like, down. So, spending a lot of time talking about historical science and publishing with them, um, the, the definition of science that one most frequently runs across getting fought over uh, is one, uh, and I'm not, I'm not arguing for this definition, but it's a definition that is always in these conversations, defines modern science as the thing which begins at the beginning of the 17th century with René Descartes and Francis Bacon, which is contrasted which, what, with what happens before by two characteristic changes. One is the development of a scientific method with formalized running an experiment, having someone else run an experiment, comparing those things, testing it, along with the concept of progress and the idea that a group of scientists working together, verifying each other's things, are going to gradually develop knowledge which will then result in useful steps which will then improve and change the world generation by generation. This is a concept come up with by Bacon at that point and changes in a big way the way people perceive what science is for. Now no, science doesn't actually succeed in doing this for another two centuries. It's really the 19th century that pays Bacon's IOU when he wrote, hey world, if you give lots of funding to science and scientists work together, we will improve the world. Wait 200 years, it happened. Um, but, but it's a different way of thinking about science in contrast with people who are doing very, very scientific things, Leonardo da Vinci being a very classic example, who is writing it all down and narrating so that nobody else can possibly ever do it. So it's about him having control over these things, only he, his state, and his patron being able to do it, not about collaborative work and accumulation of knowledge by group, but individuals, states, places, and geniuses developing new stuff. When people argue that there's no science before the modern era, that's the closest thing to a sense of the definition of that, that they're using. Now, there are many problems with that, and there are many other words to be said about what counts as science, but that is usually the debate swivel point well, um, me, that historians have. Let, let, let me propose this thing that <laughs> that's a fine definition of science. It's there, you know, you can take it, you can make a text to a certain. But that's a fine definition of science. Now, is that what science fiction is based on? Is that what science fiction is that the science that science fiction makes? It stores out of no, no, of course it is. It makes it out of any kind of crack wacky speculation. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, stuff as crazy as Lucian's idea that you could, you know, you could have gone to the moon by a whirlwind. Or John Carter of Mars, you know, you fall asleep from looking at the stars and what? We're up on Mars, of course. Um, but that but I mean the, the stuff of science that the classic science fiction uses, it's very rarely something that they worked out they think, this is scientific experiments and, and accumulated literature have proven that this is the case. Now I'll write a story where that's shown. No, that's that's not how it works. It's like, hey, if that's so, maybe this is so. You know, maybe if you get bathed in radioactive waves, you'll turn into a giant brain. <laughs> start shrinking away to nothing. You know, who knows what could happen? That's science fiction. For me though, that doesn't sound like science. What? It doesn't even sound like, no, it doesn't yeah. sound like science. No. But, it, but it makes call it science. It's, yeah. on the, it's on the title of the book, a yeah. science fiction novel. It's not science, what are you asking? What if you eliminate science fiction? In many ways, that which is characteristic of Bacon for me is 
very characteristic of it, which is not the specific scientific conclusions that are come to or the specific scientific things that are happening, but the confidence that science will get powerful, uh, that science is powerful, that science will get more powerful over time, that when you do stuff with science, it's going to have big effects on nature, that society is going to change by generation by generation. Those are the things which, you know, every lucky star space ranger book teaches you over and over. And that Bacon believes, and that Descartes believes, and that Aristotle is not. Aristotle thinks we're going to come to understand a really interesting, but comparatively unchanging world. Um, and so in that sense, that kind of science fiction is very, very Bacon, very un Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, regardless of all three of these things having erroneous technical facts. Well, well, Bacon would never propose the, the kinds of things that go on in uh, early science fiction, even in his own scientific terms. Though. I mean, he would never say, pretty soon we're going to find out X. You know, he, he did not speculate. He said, well, you know, let's stop and wait and see what does come of these kinds of this way of working. Uh, that's all I'm saying is that the he science fiction. He certainly speculated. He does. Yeah, he does for a while. Think, well, there you are then. So I, 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 would, never, I would never deny uh, uh, the New Atlantis as a kind of a science fiction kind of thing. Um, but I, I do believe that, that the science of classic science fiction is uh, uh, structurally functions in about the same way as uh, the non-scientific uh, or mythological um, stuff older literature, like in, in the Golden Axe, uh, Lucius Apuleius. Uh, what is this? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start. Maybe she gets it. So. But in, in Lucius, in the Golden Axe, there's a, a character who falls in love with this uh, slave girl, and uh, he has sex with her constantly. Finally, he feels like he's losing his virility. She says, well, I know how to fix that. I know this witch, and she, I'll get a potion from her, and it'll, it'll bring back your, your virility. And she says, fine. So she goes to get the, the potion, but she makes a mistake, or the witch makes a mistake. And the potion that, that comes back that he finally takes, instead of giving him more virility, turns him into a dog. Um, and that's how he has to live for the rest of the book until finally he gets um, let out of it by, by the goddess Isis. Now, if, if this were a science, you could, you could write a science fiction novel exactly like that. <coughs> Instead of a magic witch, you have a scientist with a potion he's just developed. And, 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 and you take it and it has exactly, not maybe turns you into a donkey, but turns you into a huge muscle guy. Or it turns you into something else. But it turns you into something because it's science. Structurally, the magic in, in, in Lucius and the, and the science in the early science, classic science fiction is functionally the same thing. So it, it's actually a little different than the, the slave thing, it's, it's, her, it's her mistress. She doesn't know if old witch. It's her, her wealthy mistress. Oh, is that and Apuleius, will, that Apuleius wants to fly. So he knows that the mistress can become an owl at night. And so he asks the girl, and by the way, this was my favorite dirty part that was written in Greek, uh, after he had taken her as a girl and then as a boy. <laughs> uh, he asked her to go and steal the oil, uh, the owl under her. Uh, but she, she, no, he wants to fly, uh, and so, and he wants to spy on people. Uh, and so she picks the wrong underwear and gets the donkey t-shirt instead. Uh, I wrote the pieces on it, so like, I know, I know the room. But, um, but I, I actually, um, I was completely fascinated by the character of the mistress, who clearly had a lot of plots of a lot of different animals, uh, and I do feel that. It is, at least on an obvious level, there is a science to it. She clearly has worked all of this out. Uh, and the cure for him being a donkey is he has to eat roses. And he spends the entire rest of the book trying to find a way to eat roses, and in various comedic ways, he can't. Uh, until in the end, Isis appears out of the water with an arm full of roses for him to eat. It's quite, it's quite a beautiful scene. Um, I feel like it starts kind of science fictional and then just goes in straight yeah. into sort of religious allegory. Well, and the, end, the ending of it is actually an ending that happens with a lot of science fiction novels. It's what John Cook calls a slingshot ending. <laughs> you get to a certain point in the story and things are going along and progressing, and all of a sudden, whoa! She 
flew off the bat or space or into some of the realm that you didn't expect at all. And, and so I think the beginning of the movie is, is, is quite science fictional, uh, and in the end isn't, as opposed to the satirical, uh, whose end is bizarrely science fictional to me, because uh, since Satyricon is another sort of picturesque adventure, I'm not going to go through the whole plot, it's ridiculous. One of the things that happens is that our hero loses his brilliance, uh, and because he has, he has killed some geese and angered the god Priapus, uh, who goes after him for vengeance for the rest of the novel. Uh, he meets a, an old uh, fat witch, much as made of how fat she is, named Anathea, and she restores his virility by uh, Pegging him with a magical dildo, and the recipe is excluded, which is what I feel makes it science fiction, actually. <laughs> how to make a virility restoring dildo is helpfully included uh, in the text. <laughs> so I feel like that's uh, that that how you start, uh, not science fiction, and then ends being quite hard science fiction. So <laughs>